So when we look today at a very, very tender subject, when we talk about transgender, by no means am I an expert. But what I have done is I've taken a lot of time and soul searching and gone inside and say, how do we as a community and a church um, put these two together and how do we explain it and how do we have conversations with our children, our neighbors, and even those who are in that arena? How do we start to walk this out and look like Jesus? I think it's really important that I disclose that I have people in my family who identify um, they are, uh, they are uh, homosexual. Um, I love them dearly. I know their story from the bottom to the top. I understand and can even reason as to why things happen. But I want you to know that the difference, we're not going to be talking about homosexuality today. I'm talking about transgender. See, homosexuality is about having um, another um, affection or attraction to the opposite, not the opposite sex, but the same sex. That's about wanting something from uh, a desire for another human being. Transgender is about, I don't like who I am. I don't, I'm not okay with me. And so there's a lot to learn here, and I don't want to be the, the sole source of your teaching. I do think I have a, a wonderful amount of resources. What I do have and what I can give you is how do we respond? What does the scripture say? And it might surprise you. It's much, much, uh, um, it's much less cultural as far as what you would see. And I love the evangelical church. I'm part of the evangelical church, but it's not always the way the evangelical church responds to this has been correct. And I'd like to show you that in scripture and see if we can't reason together. Now, it will take a roundtable talk for us, and that's what the Birds and Bees Tease is about. And what I do is I invite you there, and um, I can uh, open it up for us to talk. But if I could, in this whole posture, I wanted to imagine my family member sitting here and being honored and loved, who hasn't come to Jesus, knows about Jesus, has maybe even been stung by people who love Jesus, including me for them to feel like there is a place at the table for her as well. So if you can just imagine her here as I talk as well, that would probably give you the posture as how I would approach this. And again, if this is not a safe place for people who, who come with same-sex attraction, then we're not a safe place at all for anybody. And there's people probably in our church with that issue, but it's so hidden and so deeply down in their soul that they would be so ashamed to share it that they would feel like they would be exiled because that's what we've done. And we need to repent of that. We are a house. We're sinners and fallen humanity come to understand the grace and the love of Jesus, which is new every morning for a reason. <laughs> we need it every morning. And so I'm going to have some suggestions. But again, please know I am not the authority here. I do have stories, but I think there's other stories that are really beautiful and lovely um, and hard. This is not beautiful. The fall sucks. Full stop. What we did and how we have uh, progressed since then, thank God for Jesus, we have grace. And we have the ability to learn day by day uh, the, the, and work our, our faith out with fear and trembling. Um, I love that video I showed you at the beginning. It's super contextual to what we're talking about today, the new humanity. The new humanity is this. It is, is that you are both a new creation. Um, in 2 John 5, 17, it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. This is a whole, there's not been a new creation since Genesis until Jesus laid down his life, went in and defeated death and came back in resurrection power to give us that. And our promise is one day we get to lay down this body and also have a brand new glorified body as well, both heaven and earth beings with total, total uh, access to all of heaven's beauty and all of earth beauty. What a great day that's going to be when we are together in eternity with our Lord and our Savior. But I want to start this by saying it is my true and total conviction that gender is not a curse. 
And so how does it happen, Kathy? And there's, it's intricate and it's complex and there's so many different stories. It happened at the core of everything that I'll talk about at the fall. And since the fall, we wanted autonomy. We wanted to call what we wanted to call good or bad, uh, uh, calling evil good and um, good evil. And so we've been calling the shots and you can see the train wreck that we've kind of found ourselves in. But let's take a look at a few things that I think it's important to understand. Now, look, I don't know all this and don't understand it. And I'm not going to explain each one of these, but this is a human being made in the image of God who has, like myself, succumbed to something that is uh, not the true identity that I think that God initiated for our humans. And I understand that all these things are things that I don't have, you don't have to study them. Look, look, why do you need to know this? Because you'll have kids in school or grandchildren in school, and you need to have a loving conversation and show them and and teach them what you believe to be the fundamental and good truths to help them navigate a world that's fallen. You have to know these things. You can't stick your head in a hole and hope it goes away and judge everybody that comes your way that's in this category because that's not what we're called to as followers of Christ. We're, in called, to, we're called to invite them to the table of his grace as well. So um, I, I do all I do know is, is that they um, feel attacked, they feel unloved, they feel that we don't agree. Now listen, agreement and, um, um, I can't think of the other, acceptance. thank you. Agreement and, accept and, and acceptance are not the same. I don't agree with this, but I accept you. Listen, if I kicked everybody out of church that was living in sin sexually, we'd be empty. Stop it. But what we have to do is try to find out where's this, if this is going to be like, here's my position was, okay, so you want to be married. Oh, okay. I can't do that. I, 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 I mean, okay, get married. If you, you want, you want to have sex, that's, oh, that's, look, I can't stop that. Um, but when now it's in my face, now what I need to do is understand how to guide my children, my family, my community as to what I believe is structurally safe and also, um, when I say copacetic, it means that we have, we are in community with these people. So if you were with, um, uh, somebody who didn't, I, I mean, this is a little bit, um, uh, broad, but if you were with somebody that didn't like, um, I don't know the, the, the food you eat, or if you were with somebody who was an ex or is a pole dancer or a, or a lap dancer or, or a prostitute. Or I remember, um, let me just tell you the story. It's always better to tell a story. We were in church and I had the privilege to speak. And this young, this uh, couple came up and this girl was gorgeous. Oh my goodness. There's something about these girls are so beautiful. I don't know what their story is, but she came up with a guy who was just completely jacked and he had a really bad speech impediment. You remember this, right, David? And he came up and he introduced himself and they wanted to give that they wanted to repent and receive forgiveness for their sins and be washed. Now, she was a dancer in West Virginia and he was the bouncer at that place that she danced at and they became boyfriend and girlfriend. And so when they came up, it was beautiful. They cried. She was, you know, just mascara all over the place. I remember leaning down. She said, God could never love me. Of course he loves you. We're cleaning her up. And he had a real speech impediment, but he was like, I want this Jesus for my life. I want this Jesus for my life. And, and so we prayed and these guys were, they were elated. They were, they, they, they had an emotional cleaning, maybe the cleanest they'd been in the longest time. Next couple of weeks, they started to come into church every Sunday. Little did we know when she left, she left in the same clothes she came in. She went home to the same clothes she had. We were very provocative. They didn't look like, you know, but she had changed. Clothes hadn't changed yet. And he had changed. He came in one morning and he was saying to us, I'm sorry I'm late. He says, you know, we were open to three o'clock this morning. I was saying, you guys get out of here. I got to go to church tomorrow. Now he's in a strip club 
telling everybody he's got to go to church. And you got to imagine something like, yeah, what kind of church you go to? And, but these, they were in progression to finding their way to Christ. And their clothes hadn't changed. Their heart was changing. And this is a very sensitive place to find somebody. You don't know where they're at in their journey. And you must always treat them with kindness and respect. And the same way that you would treat Jesus. Because that's who you're talking to. You are talking to the Imago Dei, which is Greek for the image of God. So when you look at this, it's easy to laugh. And maybe I'm prepping you. Maybe God's setting us up. Maybe somebody's going to come in and, and they're going to identify. And they're going to be in one dress, but they look like another, you know, uh, gender. And you're going to say, can we, is it safe to say gender? And I can feel it already, guys. I'm telling you right now. There's you guys set up right now. Some of you, about time we get some law on this and get some rules and tell them what's going to happen. I'm, I'm waiting to hear what you said. And the other one's like, you better, I got my email ready. I'm going to hit send if you don't give some love and kindness and tenderness and let us all know. I mean, there's two positions. It's not a position. Everyone is unrighteous. No, not one is righteous. We have all fallen. And so how do we address this? Sexual sin is huge in the Bible because it affects your body. It goes much deeper than just the surface sin, which is maybe a lie that you tell, or if you take something, that can all be recovered. But when you sin against your body, it's irrevocable. I hope I said that word right. <laughs> now, so... This is going to be, this is in our life. It may not be in your life now, but let's prep our hearts to be able to know what to do when it is. So this all happened in my estimation, not all of it. It's been around a long time. You can go back to Nero. I can go back and show you that there are some real strange things. But I mean, one of our American heroes who was on a Wheaties box out of nowhere decides that he's always been a woman. This was like a real head tilt for most of America. And now it seems, as far as data goes, as far as the database goes, that this has exponentially grown. I think if I, I'm, I'm quoting out of context, but let me just say this, that, I mean, in the year 2011, there was 211 people who were going for transgender. That was reassignment sex. And it was in 2016, there was 3,223. I mean, it had increased so much that it's almost like a floodgate had opened. And so that face and these images of this is a, a woman who identifies as a man but was able to get pregnant and have a baby. So she took an enormous amount of testosterone. Guys, I've been steeped in this for a couple of months now. And it's not, it's hard because I don't know, I know as a doctor, that when you take hormones that are contrary to your natural, your natural DNA, you're going to have a show that's not going to be fun. You are really wrecking your life. And I think that's some of what I want to tell you, that no matter how you try to change this, in order for you to try to become a, a male or a woman, you are going to have to have augmentation to your body and you're going to have to have serious and I mean serious mega doses of hormones that are not natural to you and the outcome is crazy in your body's geneticist not in your mental illness and or not, it's not even illness your mental uh, acuity there is a lot of mental illness and depression that goes with this as a woman who's gone through menopause who had estrogen change and a man's taken estrogen do you know how crazy they're gonna get holy cow that's not a good move or a woman taking testosterone immediately starts growing facial hair and going bald I will show you some of these pictures but these are things that are in our culture. We are not conforming to culture. The gospel does not conform to culture, but you have to live in a culture and take that gospel to it. Do you understand me? So here we go. I just want you to watch this just a, a little bit more out of, in, out of my expertise and in their expertise. This will kind of help you understand. This is a young lady and just before you think that I'm showing bias here, I've done, I've stayed on both sides of the camp, listening and learning and, and trying to understand what Jesus would say. But this young lady, uh, 
after you change, they call it top surgery or bottom surgery. After you do that, oh my goodness, guys, it's major what happens in your body. It's major what happens in your body. They're never the same and they're never without medication again because they have all augmented their body in a way that is counterintuitive to its natural running. Uh, let's just listen to this. I'm going to put the rest of that video. It'll um, uh, put it on Facebook if you'd like to look at it. It's just, again, a look into the data, the statistics. Now, what I've done to prep myself to talk about this, because I know it's volatile, and I know there's, like I said, there's two, there's generally two camps here where you better lay down the law or you better show some grace, but I, I really believe that what I'm going to show you from Scripture is exactly how we need to respond. Um, I do know that it's so sensitive that many of us are already coming offended. And the Scripture says in the last days that... The love of many will grow cold and many will be offended. And, and this can be offensive because you want to protect and preserve. But you also, I think, as either a parent or a grandparent or any influencer, have the ability to sow the right seed. Every transgender testimony that I've listened to, both actively and uh, what they call detransitioning, wanting more than ever to change it, said that no Christian ever talked to them. They shunned them. They never came near them. They sneered at them. They would walk away from them. How are they ever going to hear the good news if we don't somehow find their humanity past their makeup? I know a lot of fake people, and they don't have wigs and eyelashes on, but they're really fake. They're, I'm not getting the real them either. They're do, living one life here and living another one here, but because they look like me, I can accept them. You see, there's a lot of hypocrisy in that. And so my out of not just my kindness, I also feel out of my obligation to be gentle and kind to all. I think, I don't want you to go to gay bars. I'm not asking you to hang out and do things, but I'm, th I'm thinking you should have relationships with people who are struggling or at least open the door to take them to tea and listen to them. I love this one story, this one, this one guy who transitioned. He's one of my favorite people. His name is... Um, um, be no, he's my favorite, and I don't know his name. His name is Beckett Cook. He's he's got a one. He used to be a very successful gay man and totally known in Hollywood. But I listened to him quite a bit, and he said that he had only one person in his life, and it was his uh, sister-in-law, his brother. He comes from a family of eight. His brother had a sister that every time he was in town, she would invite him to coffee or lunch or go out. He said, I would talk about guys, guys, and she would talk about God. But she let me, she cared about me. She was with me. She wasn't trying to convert me. She was just telling me about the incredible stuff that God was doing in her life. And little by little, that, not just that wore him down, but the Holy Spirit was w working on him. And I think some of you may say, Kathy, I don't have the aptitude to do that. I'm afraid that I might just go milly vanilli. And that's okay. You might not be called to do that. But I'm telling you that Jesus, when that prostitute who was caught in the act of prostitution, he said, if you want to cast a stone, any of you that are here without sin, go ahead and do it. You see, sexual sin or perversion, or gambling, or drug addiction, or being, um, you know, prejudiced, or uh, slave trading. I mean, one of the most famous songs that was ever penned, as far as the Christian culture is concerned, is Amazing Grace, which was penned by a man who was a slave trader and a rapist. But when God got a hold of his heart, he changed. And the only hope that these people have, I believe, is us seeing past the facade and the sin that they're living in. Like we have to do with each other all the time. I have a son that had a problem with uh, drugs for years, addiction, major addiction. And uh, either I say to hell with you and the way that you want to live or I'll love you through it. But I can't agree with it. I can't agree with it. I'm not going to condone it, but I'm going to, I'm going to walk with you as you, as you fight this out. Remember, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness in the spiritual uh, wickedness. Now, I want to say to you that I do believe that there is a strong open door for the spiritual wickedness in the United States of America, around the world. But in the United States of America, we're influencing these other cultures 
Europe and Australia and everywhere. And I'm telling you, that's what you can get mad at. You want to get mad at something? Let me see you pray. Are you fasting? Are you, I'm like, show me, show me some real spiritual muscle on your knees, not with just how good you can tell somebody off and how silly they are about the way that they're dressing. And no, it's not okay. I, a, a transgender, I, I'm not into having... Um, any sexual, I don't, sex shouldn't even enter into child's education. I mean, what are we doing? I know that's crazy. But what we do is we don't rail. We get into a place where we can push back the narrative. And you don't do it by getting mad because they're mad. And let me just tell you, their guns are loaded and ready for any scripture you throw at them. What they're not ready for is saying that I see you. I don't agree with it, but I love you. And I'm sorry for what you've suffered. I'm sorry for the way my culture has treated you. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. Would you go to coffee with me and just kind of tell me your story and teach me? Just teach me. And not everybody's going to do that, but some of you can. And so help me. Help me, Lord. Help me understand what to do with this generation. Remember, for the last couple of weeks, I'm saying, this wants to master me, Lord, but you want to master me. I want to be mastered by you and your righteousness, not by this. Help me. God opposes the proud and he gives grace that is ability, anointing, um, strength, uh, dunamis power to overcome sin, which you'll hear in these testimonies of people who have walked straight out of debauchery. And I'm talking about you want to talk about transgender, homosexual, porn, prostitution. Jesus wants to talk about lust in your heart. He wants to go to the root of the things, not the fruit of the things. He's got to get to the bottom of it. What has destroyed this? And so um, I'm going to read now scripture. And I can remember doing this with great pomp and great righteousness years ago. I almost took like a shotgun and I was plowing down anything that was evil. It just felt good, but I used it wrong. And I'm going to show you that now. So prepare yourself. Romans one, it says that the wrath of God is now being revealed from heaven. Remember last week we talked about wrath. It's what you're going to get exactly what you want. You want that? I'm going to give it to you. He goes, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, un, uh, the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Look around. This is his. It's his creation. Um, I believe that we're coming into a space and a time where we're seeing everything changing, even interdimensionally. There's things that are going on. What an exciting and uh, challenging time to be alive. He goes on to say, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, this is where the wrath, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts, to their sexual impurity and the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. Just say amen. <laughs> Because of this, now he's setting the course of how did this, how did this happen? This is Paul talking to the Romans, the most promiscuous, lascivious, debauched time. It was out, out in the open, just 
uh, um, remember I told you I was looking for the Corinthian prostitutes and what that opened, what door that opened for me, finally got that taken care of. But I mean, like all the things that they, they were seeing. And remember, Roman execution were naked men hanging and rotting. You go against the Roman government, you're going to hang on this cross and you're going you're gonna to rot there and people will see it and be afraid of us. The only thing the Roman government had was death and violence. And so Jesus conquered both of those. And so he's talking to the Roman people. He's going into, Paul is saying in a Christian culture, this is how this happened. And this is why this is going on. I'm going to tell you, not as a matter of fact, because I don't know for sure, but it is, it's literally better than it was in the Roman days. Trust me, because we have some civil, civil rights and liberties. But it, as, as much as you're seeing now, Paul saw this, you know, unfettered. It goes on to say, because of this, because they want their way, they, I feel like I don't want to go to work. I feel like I don't love him anymore. I feel like they don't listen to me. I feel, I feel, I feel. You don't walk by what you feel. You walk by faith in the son of God. And you don't walk by your sight, what you think, what you know, what you feel. He says, because you are, this is what you're getting. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with one another and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. Uh, there, that's a big, big thing to, to figure out. What's the due penalty? Some people used to say in my day, as I've been a Christian, that AIDS was their penalty and God is cursing them. And I don't believe that. I believe there is a loneliness, a depth of loneliness. And I know a couple who's been married for 30 years, two men. They live right. Uh, they are in monogamous relationships. They're very honorable. They take care of their community. They're committed to serve. You can't really slam them. But... I mean, as far as living morally, what, what we can do is see people who are taking the lust of, of um, this uh, debauchery and walking it out in such a shameful way that they continue to stay in the darkness and it gets deeper and deeper and the lust gets more amplified. It gets worse and worse and worse. Back to the couple who has um, been married, or they're not married, they've been together for 30 years, but... Um, what do you do with that? I just listened to their story. See, because the one was brought up in church, but was so shunned and believes that the doors would flame up if he walked into a church, he wouldn't come. I'm, I'm not good friends with them. I just know their story. And so what do we do with that? Well, we have conversation. We talk. We talk about the gospel. And I think uh, you're going to hear a woman in a minute do it much better than I can because she's come out of the homosexual environment and transgender and the queer and all the debauchery that goes along with it. I think the point that she makes is the, the point that we have to have today. But I'll continue this scripture by saying um, that penalty could be a number of things, but there is a penalty. I don't, I mean, it could be a number of things. But when you give, when a woman gives herself away to 17 partners, to 30 partners. There is, there is something intrinsically that's broken. I think about, I've listened to porn stars' testimonies. And it's horrific about how they're so broken on the inside. Um, but God, again, this is why new creation, new humanity is so unbelievably beautiful. You go down and you lay down the old man and you raise up a new human being. You now have the spirit to overcome and wash your brain of the things that you've been through. But in a woman, she will never trust. She will, she has, you know, a, a, a husband that leaves her or a baby daddy that leaves her. And so she goes from man to man broken and she can't be fixed until King Jesus comes. I mean, so I try to do a broad swipe of like sexual sin is so destructive, but it's so okay in our culture. I, there's very few people that we have married who have come together that are, have been abstinent until their marriage. But we ask them to purify themselves before God and start afresh. Um, that's a whole other story altogether. Let me finish in 28. 
He says there's penalty in their bodies, due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over. Listen, this is the second thing. He's given them what they want. He gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Um, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways doing wrong. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I can remember preaching this at a church in Maryland and I would say, you all are sinners. And, and the truth is, is that every one of us love you. Every, every one of us can find ourselves in one of these adjectives. Sinful, boastful, lying, not honoring your mom and dad. He's not, he's like, he's like, there is this sin culture. How far will you take it? How dark will that darkness be? How much will you let this open until he says, what do we do with this? How do we respond? Now, this is Paul talking to the Romans who are in this immersed. They're in a cultural soup of debauchery, and he's pulling them to the table of Jesus Christ. And this is what he says to them. This is what he says to us today. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else for, whatever, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now we know that God's judgment is against those who do such things is based on truth. So when a mere human being passes judgment on them and yet do the same things, meaning how can you be the one to call them not worthy to come to the table when you're still a work in progress yourself, sanctified, purified, and justified? Now you have the spirit to help you overcome that sin. And you want to pray for them to have that spirit to help them overcome sin as well. It goes on to say in three, so when a mere human being pass judgment on them and yet do the same things. Do you think that you will escape God's judgment or do you know, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended, intended to leave, lead you to repentance. And the idea is again, Paul, I love this in the message. I didn't put it up because I didn't think we had time, but he says, if you can now receive God's grace to help you through all the sin and all the things that you're still being cleansed and you're day by day being renewed moment by moment, faith to faith, glory to glory. He says, you've got to help see these people to the table as well. It's hard. This is not easy, but you want to know what you're called to it. So you were born to this season because you have the ability the anointing and the power through the Holy Spirit to navigate this very, I would say, tumultuous time. But was it more tumultuous than what Paul had? By no means. By no means. In fact, we have something greater. The kingdom of God has grown. Prayer, um, ability, uh, agency. And so we can make a change. But I'll finish with this. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant hearts, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they've done to those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality. He will give eternal life, but to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil for first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good first for the Jew and then for the Gentile for God does not show favoritism. Um, there God is establishing his loyal 
covenant with the Jews. It's them first and then the rest of the world. They're his special uh, apple of his eye, his special bride. But I, I have to say what you're hearing here is hard. And so I hope some of you have homosexual friends or maybe some transgender or people who are confused. I really want this to be a safe place for people who are having struggles to come and be able to hear the gospel without even thinking for a moment that they wouldn't be welcome here. Not one moment. This has got to be that place. That's what church is. And this is not, listen, this is not across the board. You can't do that. I mean, what I'm saying is so contrary to really a lot of places, but don't you think that Judas, when he sat at the table with Jesus at the last supper, he says, there's one here who's going to betray me to death. He knew that there was somebody there that wasn't righteous. He knows that God do that. Let God figure that out. We just make a safe place for them to come. And you say, well, well you're going you're to let them serve. Are they going to teach our children? What are they? This is the kind of stuff that you deal with after 18 years. We've, we've had so many conversations. I'm like, I cannot answer, but on a basis to basis situation, I have to know the heart, the intent. Are they born again? Do they have God? Are they abstaining? Do they still struggle with same sex? Because what I do learn about this is everybody who does get cured of homosexuality or transgenderism they still struggle even after they're born again and what you need they just don't succumb they say help me God with this feeling help me God I don't want to have this I choose you every day they're choosing every day they're they're putting things away so that they can seek and pursue righteousness I think it's maybe hard to believe because I think some of us think that we're just righteous and right with God but we don't understand our own pride and our own internal workings that God is working on so this is a testimony of a young lady who was um, she identified as a man she never had the surgery um, uh, and was also homosexual it's, it's funny because it's oh my goodness there's so many layers to this but uh, you can identify as a man, uh, but like women, so it's just, I, I, I'm not even going to try to explain this. You don't even need to figure that out, but I just want you to hear her little, her, her small testimony. Um, I, I think it's very poignant for what we're learning, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> so, uh, Jackie, um, Jackie Hill, Jackie Perry Hill. I have one more and that'll also be posted. That will be posted, but listen, that was what I want. I'm trying to say sin shall not be your master. You're, you're not under law anymore. You're under grace. You see, you can, but it, you can change, but you have to receive the grace and you almost have to mess up so much. And even sometimes so long that you come to a place where you understand your utter poverty and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. They're blessed because you understand you need a master that is gracious and loving and, 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 and patient and, he's, and, and you know, faithful in everything he does because we're not. And so for you who are in the house, who have people who or maybe even you who are struggling with same-sex attraction or you, you have some inner workings, just know that there is a pervasive spirit that is trying to consume you and to tell you that you're not glory for God, that you're not good and not worthy of his love. And I'm telling you, there's a whole bunch of things that happen with that, but you are his glory. You have, Jesus has made unto you wisdom he has sanctified you which means he has purified you and he has made you righteous before God you are not perfect you are still in the flesh and you are still like my bouncer guy from West Virginia working at a strip club going to church finding out who he is which takes a lifetime and I just wonder you know I mean, I'm, I'm slightly nervous about the, you know, what this opens and how the talks continue, but that's why I think birds and bees is very in, important. I mean, what if a man walked in in a dress and it was very obvious 
I mean, I don't see that often. I'm not in New York, but I have seen it in Hagerstown. I'm just saying. I mean, how would we act? Would we all be whispering? Would we all be in, in, a, in a corner? But what if I, I can see his sin? <laughs> mm. That's it. <laughs> this is the bottom line. I, I love this one question that she said, you don't go in and try to convert them and stop having them to have same sex. That's not even the goal. If, if you still had your sexual proclivities, and it, would you be holy even with that? I mean, like, if, 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 if homosexuality goes away, do you still need a Lord? Um, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or he's your Lord. And what's hard when we have these places where there's churches who celebrate and worship Jesus, and there's many of them, there's many of them, uh, and they're affirming of everything, come as you are, do what you want. There's a struggle with me with that because I'm like, we are w walking toward righteousness and day by day peeling off the old man. And so there's a place for you to say, he, my flesh is not my Lord. And like I said, if I took all the people who were addicted to porn, all the people who were addicted to overeating, over shopping, over, there is some place that the enemy is going to try to master you and you have to say no. And that is a day by day thing. And you do it by saying, help me. God opposes the proud, I'll do it myself. I don't need no help. I can manage this. I can have another lover. I'll find somebody who understands me. I'll go to the next sheep shack. I'll find somebody. You keep on running into the same problem, and then finally you're exhausted. And when you get to that place where you want to die, finally God's like, hallelujah, because you need to put that old man down so I can give you a new body, a new heart, and a new start. That's a good place for an amen. It's difficult, right? It's wild that I feel like I'm talking about this. I mean, this is like the last thing that you want to do, but it has to be a conversation. So here's what happens. This is your instructions. These are your marching orders. Kathy, what do we do? Like I have somebody who identifies as a, he, it's a she, but she identifies as a male, and I work with her, and she's one of the kindest people I know. She shows up all the time. She doesn't really gossip. But, you know, everybody doesn't like her. What do I do? I mean, listen to what the scripture says. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation. Salvation, that word is soteria, that, that is a deliverance, being delivered from whatever masters you. It's kind of cool if you see the Egyptians coming out from, I mean, the Hebrews coming out from Egyptian mastered. He freed them, and, and now they're going into the promised land. He says, uh, offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no, this salvation, to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, redeemed us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He is purifying us. And I'm like, you're here today being washed in the word. You're serving. We're learning every day. I know that I had an encounter with Christ that changed my heart. Some people have a cerebral encounter with God. They figured him out. They've got it down. They've got the rules. But I've been changed in my heart. And I feel like this is what God is asking you to do is let me work on your heart. Not your do, but your who. He goes on to say, these then are the things you should teach. Kathy, I was looking for instruction. I asked for help. This is what you teach, Kathy. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anybody despise you. What that means, make, make them feel like they're lower than you because you have a different opinion. He says, but here's what you do. Remember 
the people, uh, remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities and to be obedient, check, to slander no one, to be peaceable, to be considerate, to always be gentle toward. I have, t- I have failed this miserably. I love Jesus with all my heart. I believe I'm going to heaven. I believe that my life shows the fruit of the spirit, but I have failed here and so have you. So we ask forgiveness. We change our mind and say, God, show me how to deal with this. Show me how to teach my kids. I want you to share share with them your traditions, your values, your core truths. They're still going to have to make choices. It goes on to say, at one time, he's reminding you. I love this with Paul. He's always keeping us humble. He's at one time, you were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved with all kinds of passions and pleasures. Amen. (laughs) Amen. He says, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us. Hallelujah. Not because of, of, our right, of our righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of the rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So having been, just as I've never sinned, look at that, just as justified, just just as I've never sinned, too good to be true, just as I've never sinned by grace, his empowerment is what keeps me from telling off people when I want to tell them off or indulging my flesh when I know it's not good. It keeps me from staying out of things that are going to be harmful for me, my family, my future, the legacy, and even Jesus' name. He's, he gives you grace. His grace is sufficient. But you ask for that grace. You ask for the power to overcome. He says, you've been justified by grace. We might become heirs having the living hope of eternal life. So this is the ticket. So what grace have you received? I can point to each one of you. What grace have you received? What grace have you received? You extend that same grace to every human being. And you say, what do you do with the hoodlums and the, the guys in prison and kids raping? And we talked about pedophiles. Like this has been a really yucky subject for me. Dang it. But then I, I hear the stories of when they were kids and they were little children And the door got open and nobody covered them. And after that, they became vile slime to our Christian community. And there was no redemptive behavior for them. I'm reminded of the of the 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 demoniac of Gadara, where Jesus said, what's your name? And they said, Legion, which was basically he was just filled with demons. And and they were cast out of him. But. That man wanted to follow Jesus everywhere he went because he got clean in a moment. And so there is an agency that we have. But I would say this now as we approach uh, communion and the end of the service and my, my really um, earnest uh, attempt to handle a subject that I'm not even comfortable with because I don't totally understand it. But I do know from the perspective of what we read here that you'll get in a situation and your children will be in a situation and you can respond with finger pointing and I'll curse you and go to hell and you can do all that. And God will forgive you. It's true. He will. He does. But there's an opportunity, one more opportunity where you can say, dude, I'm going to, I'm just going to pray for you. I mean, you just, you know, just, you don't have to, you know, the Lord says, When somebody does an evil to you or an insult, you don't return an insult for an insult or an evil for an evil. This is going to blow your mind. But read uh, 1 Peter 3. You're supposed to bless them. (laughs) What do I do? And you might not do it right away. But sometimes God will let you enter a heart. I'll never forget the time in my office that somebody trusted me with the perversion that they had in their life and that they were coming out of, man, if you heard his story, you would weep. Nobody knows his story because he couldn't, I don't, a lot of men don't trust other men, but somehow he felt safe to tell me. And 
I, I prayed for him. I touched him on his shoulders. He wept. He wept and wept and wept. I can see his face right now. He did things that he was so ashamed of. And I was the only one that told him that God would love him even past that sin. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of agency that you have. And God will give you what you need when you need it. But I'm going to let Jackie Perry Hill finish this. It's just really small. Her testimony will be on it. Again, she's just going to give you some insight. We're going to take communion. Um, we need to talk. I know you might have questions. I probably don't have a whole lot of answers. I know you might have people in your family that are tr struggling with same-sex attraction or homosexuality or transgenderism. I mean, like, I want, I, I'd like a shot at their good hearts. I just feel like I want to see them first as human and just try to understand of all the debris that's piled up on top of them and the insane stuff that happens. Remember, at the very beginning of Highly Compelling, I said that we are a demutation. Adam was perfect in his, in his, uh, in his entire body from head to toe. He was going to live forever. There was nothing wrong. But over these, the, our history says 6,000 years of demutations. We have so many errors in our body and our DNA at this point. We are going to probably be very surprised at a lot of things. And so I say to you... Um, Take a hold of Jackie here. Amen. So she's powerful. That testimony will be on Facebook. Again, I try to look. I've been on both sides of the camp. I've listened with compassion. I've, I've had judgment. I, I've, when you hear stories of how these people, even her story, how, how it begun for her and what happened and how she, I remember, and I'll share this at Birds and Beasts Tea, the, the proclivity that I had with an abusive, sexually abusive father and a very submissive and docile ma who was very much um, um, emotionally and physically abused. Uh, what that does as far as men, and I can tell you that the only way that I am where I am today is by God's grace and you too and them too. And so when you see them, I just want you to be aware that God is with you, with them. How would God speak to them? How would Jesus speak to them? I know that's so cliche, but the truth is, is that he sees, you know, it's not even, it's an energy too. It's, it's not just what your words say or your actions. It's, it's, it's what's in your heart. Like when I see hoodlums and punks and young kids that are acting a fool, do I curse them in my heart or do I bless them in my heart? Do I lose angels to them? Do I ask for God to show them the way to intervene? Do I cover them for the minute that I get to see their antics? That's what we're called to, to be a, bless, a blessing. Grace does not lead us into destructive behavior. Sin does. And grace is the only remedy for sin. It's the kindness of God that leads us to a change of mind. I started this whole thing with Joshua said to his people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things. I've asked you for the last three weeks to put, you probably don't have time. I get it. 20 minutes aside, just worship. And really, I just love what Jackie does. All she said is, help me, Lord. I still feel this. Help me. But little by little, this is the good news, guys. Honest, this is true. It starts to fall off. I have no need to cuss anybody out. I have no need to, I don't, I mean, really, it's a joyful place on the inside. God, really, you start becoming more and more of what you focus on. And so what you fix your gaze on is really what you'll become. And so I just encourage you to join me in some wonderful, these are wonderful, I have to, to, um, uh, full disclosure, I did not read um, Gay Girl, Good God. That's Jackie's book. I did not read that. I'll be reading that on vacation this week. But Them Before Us is one of the best. It's a book on stats. It's a book on children being raised and the need for the design that God has for a heterosexual woman and man uh, bond with their children and how that happens. It's, it's facts driven. It's not spiritual driven. This is not a book where you're going to have scripture after scripture after scripture. It's not there. It's really the stats that you need to understand. And with that work and some compassion, also good pictures, bad pictures. Listen to me. You got to get to your kids very quickly. Um, I mean, as soon as you can, there's a adolescent book. There's a mid, uh, um, uh, 
like a five to 10 book, and then a book that you talk with kids as they're going through puberty, just to have conversations. You need to be the one talking to them about sex. You Listen, all these transgender, every one of them online, a community, they found, they, for me, back in the 70s and the 80s, it was, it was goth. It was uh, like, but they all wore black and, you know, you stayed away from them because they were dangerous. And then it was potheads and, and drug addicts. I mean, like every, there was like, you find a group, you cling to the group. I think about, you know, the Bloods and the Crips, how they found family and they became what they beheld. So let us become what we behold and bring that to our community. Here's a couple of questions and we're done. We're setting up for communion if you want to come up. How can parents help instill a secure and stable sense of sexual identity as God designed? You should be the first one, the first seed in your child's heart. They're going to have many other seeds, guys. They're going to have many other seeds. Please get in there. Indicate early, uh, consistent, age-appropriate education at home. It has to start at home. If you're learning, like my boys and... and um, I did and my brother did with my father's books that he had in his bag that he hid under his bed. Not a good place to start. Not a good place to start. Prepare for moments that you're going to happen. This is why we have to have this conversation. Having a transgender classmate, if your kids have it or you have somebody who identifies, you're, how do you deal with that? What's the conversation? And then second moment, participating in a gender pronoun introduction. You're going to be asked to do things. You know, I'm going to suggest that you don't fight it. I'm going to say, just try to honor and then bless. If you can't bless with words, bless on, in your heart. Uh, just, just radiate that I see you. I see you and you're worthy to be seen. You're not defiled to me. Woman caught in the act of adultery. You know, it was a sexual sin. Um, again, I want to reiterate as we prepare for communion that transgender is about me. Homosexuality is about others. Transgender is about identity. That I'm not good. I'm not right. And that it's, uh, I think, you, knowing that you go in a little bit different in what you're, how you love and, and letting them know that you see them because they want to be seen. That's why sometimes the flare up is pretty crazy. Anyway, how'd I do? Thank you. Gosh, that was, that was tough. <laughs> Thank you. Look, I, I tell you, I cried over this. I told David, I'm not, I can't, I can't, I can't, but I did this really wrong. We're coming in for communion uh, with my, uh, my loved ones in my house. I literally told them out of love and out of fear, and this is about 30 years ago, rode all the way to Philadelphia to tell them that they were going to hell. Not a good move. Not a good move. I later repented. I later asked for their forgiveness, but it really did do some damage for them and about the way they see God. And it's still not right yet today, but I bless them every day.